All right, look with me, would you please, in Joshua chapter 10. Let me do just a little bit of review with you, the things that we've learned thus far, and then we'll consider this before us. Father in heaven, meet with us now and direct us, Lord, in your word. And Lord, trusting today that you would have exactly for each of us what is needed for this week and for the journey ahead. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. In Joshua chapter 1, we find out that Moses, the man that God used to lead Israel out of Egypt has now gone to be with the Lord. We know that Joshua, his minister, the son of Nun, now has been appointed to become the new leader of Israel. Chapter 1, the Lord deals with uh, Joshua and promises him good success. He gives to him some instructions on a personal level to stay in God's word, to continue to follow that, to meditate on that, and that he, would, he promised him good success. He promised him his presence. He said that as he was with Moses, he would be with Joshua. Now listen, before Joshua is prepared to lead the people of God, Joshua needs to be ready as an individual and be prepared personally for what the Lord has for him. And so oftentimes we desire for there to be success in, uh, in other people's lives, in areas we want correction. But we first must begin in our own lives. We must first let the Lord deal with our hearts and direct us. And so this morning, uh, if you're looking to Israel in general, if you're looking at people, other people specific, why don't you today do spend some time alone with the Lord and let the Lord help you to be strengthened and directed. From there, we see that Joshua would send people into view out Jericho, and that's when they would meet Rahab, who was a harlot, but would become a part of the people of God, a tremendous picture of God's great grace, and uh, we studied some things regarding her. And then we moved on to Joshua chapter 3. In Joshua chapter 3, we see Jordan, the Jordan River is crossed. In chapter 4, we see memorials that were raised up. The Lord brought them through, uh, brought them over, and we discussed that with the ark and the priest stepping in and how God parted it. Joshua set a memorial up in the middle of it, and then he directed them as God had told him to, to set a memorial on the other side, so that any time in the future generations, people would walk by and ask, what do these stones mean? He would point to them and remind them of what the Lord had done for them. Now look, it's a tragedy at times when people don't know in our lives what the Lord has done for us. And we need to brag on the Lord. We need to have memorials in our lives too for our children and for our grandchildren. Your testimony of how the Lord saved you. Your testimony of how the Lord brought you up and what the Lord's brought you through. That has power. And especially it has power to those that know you and those that are close to you. So let's live a life that reflects that testimony. And then let's speak of the Lord and speak of what he's done for us. And then we watched in Joshua chapter 5 as it was time for the people of God now that they'd crossed the Jordan to get serious. It was time for them to get back to some things that God had directed them to. And we watched that one of those things was to continue to keep the Passover. And so there they remembered the Lord in the Passover. It was also there in a place called Gilgal where those that had not been circumcised were separated unto the Lord in a particular fashion as God had in his covenant promise with Abraham. It was there also that the manna ceased and they began to eat new bread. The name Gilgal means it speaks of a reproach that's been rolled away. No longer did they have an identity of that of being slaves, of that of being wanderers, but now they were in the promised land. The Lord had brought them in, and now they were going to go forward, and they were going to conquer. And that's important because we'll come back to Gilgal. They entered into Israel. If you were looking at a map of Israel, they crossed in oh, what would be considered the Ohio State Line, about midway in, and they came to the first city, and that first city was Jericho. Jericho was that city with the great big walls. And God led them in that miraculous fashion to march around it seven days. One time a day for six days. The seventh day, quietly marching, blowing the trumpet. You remember that? The seventh day, marched seven times. The walls came down. God gave them a victory. But a man took something that he wasn't supposed to. A man by the name of Achan. So God gave them victory in chapter 6. and chapter 7, there was trouble in the camp. They went up against the next city. The city was called Ai. And they went up on their own. They didn't seek God's advice. They sent a smaller group of people there and they lost. They ended up running back, fleeing, and even had loss of life there. Joshua, was, boy, he's tore up by this. He approaches the Lord. The Lord says, you've lost here because there's sin in your camp and there's something that needs to be dealt with. And so a man by the name of Achan was eventually brought before everyone, he and his family. He had taken garments, he had taken gold, he had taken silver, things that God had told him not to. Very specifically, God gave instructions. And because he had not obeyed, he experienced the judgment of God. And I emphasize that to you to remind you of what Christ has done for us. Our God is a holy God. 
Our God is a righteous God. Jesus is not just just, but he's also the justifier. Jesus bore our sin debt. And sometimes we like to have this picture of God being some little old man out of touch, but he's not. Our God is a burning fire. Our God is holy, and we don't even really understand holiness. But that's who God is, and God, no sin, no, no, no shadow of sin, no shadow of turning in God was sin. And so, friend, when you hear that story of Achan being put to death in his family, you think, boy, what a, what a God that he would do that. What a God that he would allow his son to bear up under his wrath for you and I. We sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And I don't know that we really recognize exactly what it is that that grace has done for us. And how we are now, as the book of Romans says, we're at peace with God. There is therefore now no condemnation. Amen. Condemnation, it's gone. We're now at peace. We have a peaceful relationship. That's something to sing about. And God's grace is the more amazing, the more we recognize the holiness and the righteousness of God. And so we see that that man and his family are dealt with in the camp where they're in awe of God and God's judgment there. God then gives directions and they go up against I. And we touched on that last Sunday morning. We saw how God took their failure and used that as a formula for success. Because God can do that. God can take our failures in life and when we turn them over to him and we follow him, God can bring good out of that. Last Sunday evening, they moved on from having victory at Jericho and I. And we saw that they had some folks that would have been the next city. So on that map as they're marching in, they have come into Jericho, and then they've come to the city of Ai. And within a three-day march, just a little bit south, they would come to a place called Gibeon. And the, the folks there were fearful of what would become of them, and so they disguised themselves. The Bible says they put on shoes and clothes that looked like they'd come from a great distance. Their food and everything they carried, they gave the appearance that they had traveled a great distance before they got to Israel, when really they had not. The Bible says very specifically that Joshua and the men who made decisions, they sought not the counsel of the Lord. They entered into an agreement with those people that they would be their servants. Very shortly after that, they found out their, the deceitfulness of this crowd. But because they had given their word and because they had entered into an agreement with them, they stayed committed to that. And those people would go on. They would be blessed by that agreement. They would be given the opportunity to be servants that would bring wood and be involved in the service in the house of God. And we see that play out in the scripture. Seems like even there were some of them who because of that, when there was the return of Israel years later, there would even be an element of those folks who would return back and continue on in the work of God. Joshua and his people realized they had not sought God's counsel and we considered that. We considered the enemy and the deception of the enemy last Sunday evening. Now we come to Joshua chapter 10, and for the first time a city is mentioned in the Bible. It's the city Jerusalem. It's not the first time that anything has happened in Jerusalem, but it's the first time the title Jerusalem is given to us in the Bible. Jerusalem is a special city. We know that in the Jerusalem area, there's a mount, Mount Moriah. In Genesis chapter 22, it's first mentioned to us that Abraham would go there and would take his son Isaac to offer him in that area. We know a thousand years later, David would come along and he would buy that particular piece of ground and that is where the temple would be built by Solomon, his son. We know that Jerusalem would eventually become a capital city specifically for the southern kingdom but of great significance to all of Israel because of the temple that would be built there by Solomon. So the king in Jerusalem at that time is not of Israel and he hears about the victory at Jericho, and he hears about the victory at Ai, and then he hears that the people that we mentioned a moment ago that entered in through deceit, the people, the Gibeonites, were now at peace with Israel, and the Bible says that he began to fear. He feared greatly. I want to move past this quickly, but I want to tell you two things that ought to be marks of the believer's life and ought to be marks of God's people as a church, and that is, number one, victory. Victory. Victory is not always, uh, by definition, what one perceives victory to be. For example, if you'd looked at Job's life, you might have wondered at times how victorious really is Job. If you had looked at the life of the Apostle Paul while he was in prison, if you had seen the scars in his body and perhaps even his, the, the disfigurement of his head from being stoned and put to death, from being beaten multiple times, you'd have said, how victorious is this person really? 
But friend, I believe if you had gotten around the Apostle Paul, and I believe if you had gotten around Job, you would have noticed something that was uniquely different about them from others. For example, it was Job who said that he knew that his Redeemer liveth and that someday he would see him. It was Job who would eventually, that statement would be made for him, that he began to pray for his friends, even those friends who had harsh comments towards him. The Apostle Paul, would have, you would have heard such things from the Apostle Paul as I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Victory ought to be a mark of the believer's life. Victory, we have victory. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given to us victory. We are more than conquerors. We are overcomers in the Lord Jesus. Henceforth, as they sang a moment ago, Brother Anthony did, there ought to be a song in our heart. Speaking on another, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody, having something going on. There ought to be something vivacious about the people of God. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the times, there is something that is burning in the heart of God's people, and that is the victory that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be a, a part of our testimony. I think it's also important that a part of that victory is that in our life there is success. God would organize and structure our lives to be successful. When we follow God's patterns, when we follow God's plans, when we commit ourselves to God's purposes, there is good success. It ought to be said of the person of God and the workplace that they work and they give themselves diligently to that. It ought to be seen from the outset of our house and the order and the structure of our homes and how we operate in our relationships with each other that there's victory. Pardon the expression. Nobody wants to copy a loser. People want to copy that which is victorious. It's, it's, it's contagious. Winning is contagious. Now I understand and I preface that by definition of what success and what winning is. But dear friend, if you're in your home or down in the mouth all the time and if serving God to you, if living for the Lord is a drudgery, if there's no joy in your heart, if you're not showing that joy and reflecting that joy in your service to the Lord, then why would your children be attracted to that? Why would your neighbor be attracted to that? If everything about serving God is bad and bleak and it's always negative, who would want that? If your attitude and your response and your relationships at work is, yeah, I go to church, but then the rest of my life is a mess. Who wants that? Our God has given us good order and good instruction. You say, preacher, well, today, I don't know that I measure up to that. Well, who does? The Apostle Paul said there's a mark, and we're pressing towards that mark of fruitfulness and Christ-likeness. But that doesn't give us allowance today to not correct and set in order and begin to allow the Lord to move and work in our lives for us to be victorious. I love the, the story in the book of Joshua because it's victory to victory to victory. And it's seeing God work and God move. They heard of the victories and they also heard of the peace. The peace. Whether or not they should have made that agreement with the people of Gibeon, it's done. And at this point now, when they heard that the people of God had victory... And they heard that they had made peace with the people of Gibeon, the Gibeonites, that bothered them. Another mark of our life ought to be peace. If my life is continually a life of upheaval, if my life is from one drama, from one mess to the next mess, if it's a constant level of dissatisfaction or being unsettled, who would want that? I love that song, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river. Hey, great peace have they which love thy what? Love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Does that say that they won't have offenses? No, they have offenses, but if I can break that down just a little bit of bottom shelf theology. When you love God's word and you know God's word and you've got God's word in your heart, then you get the big picture. And the little things, you don't sweat the small stuff. You just get past it because it's in, in light of the grand scope of things, this is not a big deal. Peace. Someday, I'm going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Someday, I'm going to give an account of my lap, of my race that I've run in Christ. And I believe that victory and recognizing my position in Christ that I have victory is going to help me to secure victory in my daily living and then also being at peace. If you're not at peace with the Lord today, number one, recognize if you're saved, there's a peaceful position. But 
friend, let's work on that disposition, that practical. And if you're struggling in your relationships with people, that's no place to be for God's people. I received a telephone call this week from someone. They no longer attend our church. There was somebody riding in the vehicle with me, and I put, had it on speaker, not knowing, and this person called, and they just said, I want to tell you something. X number of years ago, I came to the church for the first time and didn't really know where to go to church, but I went that day, and preacher, you preached that day about having right relationships, even with children who were straying, even with children who you were at odds with. And he said, I had spent years at odds with children, and I determined that day that I would seek to have right relationship even with them whatever that would look like. And he said, I purposed that day and I made it down. He said, preacher, I just want to tell you, I'm thankful. I'm thankful today that you listened to the Lord and you made that statement that day. Now sometimes that, that's complicated, that particular thing. Well, that ought to be the, the heart of every believer, though, to be at peace with folks. I'm not looking to go around and get into it everybody. Now, I have to confess to you that there's a part of my flesh that is all male and probably has a bit of toxic masculinity. <laughs> and there are some times when there are things I say, blah, 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 bless God, I want to I, I get this guy some dental work here real quick, right? <laughs> but that's when I have to slow down and say, Lord, help me. That's not who I want to be and that's not, that's not what I'm called to do at this juncture. And so, Lord, please help me to be at peace with folks. And there are times when I've offended folks, and there are times that, knowingly and unknowingly, and there are times when I needed to go to folks and say, listen, for what it's worth, I want you to know my heart. My heart is that I, don't, I want to be at peace with you. I'm at peace with my God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and I desire to be at peace with you through the Lord. You say, but preacher, there are people who won't accept that from me. Well, whether they accept it or not, you and the Lord can put that out there, and you can know in your heart, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'll leave it at that. You can pray for that person, you can love that person. You can look for ways to, to be kind to that person. But more than that, you can carry around in your heart a peace that you've let that thing go, so to speak, and you're trusting the Lord with it, and that relationship is in his hands. It's amazing what the Lord can do with things. So they heard this testimony about them, victory and peace, and that caused them to be nervous. So here, very quickly, i got to move on. i got 15 minutes to give you the message now. The king in Jerusalem, he begins to get nervous, and so he does something. He goes and he gets up five kings together, five kings, and they are going to make war against the people in that town, that place called Gibeon. They're going to go against them because of the alliance that they made with Israel. Isn't that interesting that even still today, that there are people who oppose the very people who are friends of Israel? There are people who have attacked America because of America's pro-Israel stance that we've had historically, and I hope that we'll be wise enough to continue to have. There have been people who've opposed us and been against that, and so they went up against the Gibeon. But see, here's what the Lord is doing. The Lord is allowing those men who would plot together to come against Gibeon to give Joshua in one day a tremendous victory, or two days, depending on how you count them, a tremendous victory that might have taken several weeks. So those kings all come together. They get outside the gate of this place called Gibeon, and they're standing there, and they're going to make war with them. The people in Gibeon, we read it in chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 6, they send message to Joshua and say, hey, we're your servants, and we're in need. I want to speak to you now from this position, how to have great days. How many of you like to have great days? I like to have great days. The Bible says in chapter 10, and verse 14, there was no day like that before. That must have been one spectacular day. Now, I don't suspect the Lord's going to cause the sun or the moon to stand still for me. I'm not going to go out and charge them that they would, uh, but I do believe that just as God gave Joshua a great day, God can give us some great days in our lives as well. How to have uh, an unbelievable day. Here's the points. Number one, number one, uh, I want you to see something where they were at. They were abiding it in Gilgal. The Bible says that they sent the message to Gilgal, which is where Joshua and the people were camped. Gilgal was that place that we talked about a moment ago where there was a memorial to the Lord. It was a place that spoke of reproach being rolled away and victory being presented. Gilgal was a place that spoke of the Passover and keeping those things. To me, that speaks of, for example, in the book of Ephesians when it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Why? We're to put on the whole armor of God, having what? The helmet, 
the breastplate, having the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, so that we're ready to do what? To stand in that evil day so that we're ready to go. God's people should consistently, daily, be in a habit and have a pattern in our walk with the Lord of being ready to go. Ready to go. Prayed up. Spending time in prayer. Spending time in the Word of God. Spending time in meditating and looking into what God's purposes are for our lives. Hey, the Christian life is more than just a Sunday life. It's not Sunday to Sunday. It's faith to faith and day to day and situation to situation. It's getting God involved in everything that's going on in our life. It's my work life. It's my family life. It's my friend life. It's my church life. It's all of those things. They were in a place of Gilgal, a place of being ready and prepared. When they received the word that there was a friend in trouble, they hopped up and they got right to it. I can help you have a great day. Number one, be prayed up and read up. Get in God's word and spend time with God every day of your life. Go through those things and remember what the Lord has done for you on a daily basis. Number two, look for opportunities to be used by God. Look for opportunities to be used by God. Uh, Joshua, we need help. Look at verse 6 with me, would you please? And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. I'm reminded of that scripture where it says to do what? Redeem the what? The time, because the days are evil. Slack not thy hand. Don't be lazy with your hand. Don't be lazy in your coming, but we need you. We need you to get on with things. Hey, is there not a sense of urgency today in our lives? Do we not look around us and see a world that's falling apart? Do we not see a world today that needs a gospel witness from the people of God? Do we not see a world today where neighbors need to see what a good, godly neighbor functions like and helps and, and, and puts a hand to things? Do we not see a world today where people are hurting and in need? And so oftentimes we curl up and we crawl inside the church a few times a week and then we go out and we see the need and we become slack in our hands. Don't be slack in your hand. Get the gospel track in your hand. Be a gospel witness to somebody. See a need, fill it. You have a friend in need, meet it. The Bible says if you see a brother who's lacking and you have it, supply it. Look for ways to be a blessing. Look for someone to witness to. Look for someone to encourage you. You know what? If you'll begin to do that, you will find people where? Everywhere. Talking about how to have a great day. Number one, be prayed up, be read up, be walking, so to speak, in the spirit where you're alive, be there. Be, be present in what the Lord's called you to. Number two, Look for places to serve. Look for people to help. Number three, be earnest in your response. Let's not be lazy. Only one life to live. This day will soon be past. This hour will be over before you know it. We'll be into the second hour here very soon. But that'll be it. You have your health today. I traveled today, or this week rather, and I visited with people who once had their health. I sat in rooms I went to homes. I sat in hospital rooms this week. I sat in nursing homes this week. I visited with people who need others now to do things for them. Who at one time sat here amongst us. Who at one time stood at our door and greeted people as they came in. Who at one time did the ministry and followed up on people who had visited church and took gospel to their door and did those things. But you know what? Today they cannot. And someday, if things run their natural course, that'll be the same for us. If things run their natural course, there'll come a Sunday when I'll not be able to do this. There'll come a Sunday when you'll not be able to attend. There'll come a Thursday or a Tuesday when you'll not be able to be involved in outreach or in ministry. Oh, listen, friend. It's in there somewhere. You better make hay while the sun's shining. You better get after it now. We say, I'm young, I've got plenty of time. It's best that you bear the yoke in your youth. It's best that you learn a good pattern of behavior. Hey, the church work and ministry work is not for the 60 plus crowd. It's for the saved crowd. It's for all of us. Not to be slacking that, hey, we need you. Get over here and help us. And so, man, Joshua heard that call. He was up and he was on the move. Look what the Bible says. Joshua, verse 7, ascended from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor had to have a great day. Number one, be where you're supposed to be. Be being who you're supposed to be. Looking for needs, looking to fill those needs. Being earnest in seeing those and responding in that. Not looking for others to do these things. 
Next, I want you to see claim divine promises. Look at verse 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. God promised victory to Joshua. God has promised victory to you, and God has given you divine promise. It's right here in his word. Do you want to have great days? Do you want to have days like never before? Hey, listen. You've got to take God's word exactly as it is, as God's word, and claim the promises of God's word. Do you want to be victorious? Do you want to walk in that peace that we referenced a moment ago? You've got to be in God's word. This is where you get those promises. This is where you learn of those promises. This is where you learn to claim those promises. There was divine promise. Follow on with me, would you please? Joshua therefore came up unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal. How? All night. He got the word. He got the promise. And he did what? He got after it. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why? Night comes when no man can work. He said, when should we get it done? Today is the day. Today is the day. This morning, if you're here and you do not know the Lord as your Savior, don't put it off another day. Don't put it off another week. Come today and let somebody show you from God's word how you can be saved and know that your sins are forgiven and know that your name is written in heaven. If you couldn't stand up right now in this assembly and say, listen, I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. I know that I'm saved. We want you to know at least what the scripture says about that so that you could be if you were to put your faith in the Lord. What a tragedy it would be for you to put that off. What a tragedy it would be to put off serving the Lord another week, another year, another month. What's hindering you? What's keeping you? What's preventing you? Joshua got up and took the men and they went all night. The Bible says in verse 10, we speak to you now. We've spoke of divine promise. Now we see divine presence. God says, I'm with you. And you have divine presence. You have the Lord with you. How to have great days. What? Be who you're supposed to be. Be looking for opportunities. Be eager about those opportunities. Claim divine promise and recognize divine presence. What did the Lord tell Joshua over and over again? I am with you. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Lo, I am with you always, even unto what? The ends of the earth. You're not going to get away from me. I'm going to help you. We have promise and we have his presence. We have his presence, divine presence. So here's this battle. Here comes Israel. Here are five kings. I've got five minutes or less to get 45 minutes in. Are you ready? Put your seatbelt on. Strap in. We'll finish it up here. You know, the roller coaster ride thing. <laughs> Clicking on. There's five kings they've assembled up against this city called Gibeon. And here comes Joshua all night. He comes against these men. God is going to do for Joshua right there in that moment, getting rid of all those enemies in a miraculous way. Joshua appears with his men, those that are with him. And the Bible tells us something. I want you to notice this verse very carefully and read it as it's, as it's written. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel. This word discomfited means great confusion. It means to vex. It means to trouble. It means to confound. It means to break. All these men who have formed this alliance against Gibeon, God does something. God works where? This is like what God did to Saul when Saul was disobedient and he was troubled and he was affected by that. Do you know, listen, God wants his people to have peace. God has an amazing way of getting into situations and causing our enemy to be discomfited, to be mixed up and messed up and stirred up and not be thinking straight. They begin to question each other. They begin to be concerned about what was going on. We've seen other situations where people literally turned on each other. Let me say to you today that there is a world that is discomfited. It is perplexed. It is vexed. It is confused. And so through that, the Lord is beginning to give victory and before it them, uh, discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way. And I'll not give you the direction, but who was it that gave them the victory? Who was it that chased them? It's written as if it was the Lord. Now Joshua and the children of Israel were there, but whose fight was that and whose battle was that? They were doing whose work? The Lord's work. When you're doing the Lord's work, not only do you have divine promise and divine presence but you'll see something here. You see divine intervention. God gets involved. And man, God does something. He takes five kings and their armies and he causes them to become so confused and so confounded that now God, with the people of Israel being used by God at his disposal, they begin to chase them and they begin to fall. They begin to have victory. And then 
God said, I'm going to do something else. He opens up the windows of heaven, and from heaven come great stones, hailstones. The Bible says that more people died that day from the hailstones coming down and hitting them than the sword that was drawn. Who gave the victory that day? God did. God did. God gave them divine presence, divine promise, and divine intervention. You know what I need from time to time in my life? Divine intervention. I need the Lord to help. I need the Lord to step into that thing. Did we pray this week at various times? Lord, we need your help in this matter. Or did we pray this week over people, hospitals, emergency rooms, marriages, children? Hey, God, we need you to do something here that only you can do, God. That's a work of the heart. God, we need you to turn something. We need you to change something. We prayed this week for a little one in the church and tests that would be taking place on Friday. And we put it out to pray and pray and pray because the, the information that physicians had given was not so great. And by Friday evening, I called yesterday morning, we had a good report that it was not as they con were concerned that it was. I don't know what took place between the praying and the looking and the finding and the doctors searching, but here's what I believe. I believe that God in some way showed himself strong in that. And we give him the glory for it. Have you ever, are you praying that way? Do you pray believingly? He is able to do above and beyond all that you ask, all that you expect. God can do those things. That's divine intervention. But you say, preacher, it's hopeless, it's helpless. There's no way for it to be resolved. Hey, my Lord knows a way through the wilderness. All I have to do is what? Follow. He gave him water out of what? A rock. He gave him manna from heaven. He supplied their needs. God can do those things. You say, preacher, my heart is so cold. It's so, so, so heavy, so indifferent in the situation. I just don't know how it can be better. Divine intervention. God, warm my heart. God can break your heart. God can warm your heart. God can stir your heart. God can supply your needs. I need you, Lord. We need you to be involved in this. Divine presence, divine promise, divine intervention. And then I would conclude, conclude with this. Divine timing. Divine timing. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, Joshua and Israel, it was getting good. Five kings, and they're whooping them all. And they got them all on the run. But they're running out of something. What are they running out of? They're running out of daylight. And what happens in a battle when the daylight ends? It gives the enemy a chance to do what? Hide, run, get off, and move on, which creates more problems. So however it transpired, I don't know all the inner workings there, but I know that Joshua spoke to the Lord, and I know what that verse says. It says that never before and never did it happen again that the Lord allowed himself to be commanded when it came to the sun and the moon to do something. What did Joshua do? For all Israel to hear, Sun, stand still. Moon, stand still. You say, preacher, do you believe that happened? Absolutely, positively, I believe that that happened. I would go so far as to tell you that you can look back in the ancient writings about this time and you'll find out that across several continents, there are several people who have written that it seems like there was a day that, it, that prolonged it and went longer than it was supposed to and it threw calendars off and everything off. And I don't need those writings to tell me that. God told me that what happened. How could that happen? Who was it that put the sun in its place? Who was it that put the moon in its place? It was God that did those things. If God wanted to right now, he wanted to make the sun stand still, it just absolutely would. You ought to be thankful that he doesn't do that kind of stuff, right? It'd throw you off. We're going to get all kinds of crazy people coming here in the spring to watch the eclipse. Can you imagine what would happen with the... Now, I don't know, maybe you're excited about that, but I got a letter saying that you could that tell the thousands of people that are coming to Johnson County, Indiana to see an eclipse going to take place. You people need to get a life, man. <laughs> I'll give you eclipse every day. Go outside and shut your eyes, man. It's free. But people are going to pay money. They're going to flood the town. I'm going to sell T-shirts. All right, I was there, man. <laughs> Can you imagine Joshua stands out? Now, why did he want that? He wanted to get more out of that day. I believe with all my heart, divine timing, that God can make up for lost time in your life like he did for Jonah. Jonah made a mess of things, but God helped him and got him where he needed to be quickly. God took a guy like Samson and God made up in Samson's death for years that Samson had wasted. 
God can take and give divine timing. He can take your life, young people, listen to me. He can take your life, young person, and he can make a lot from it when you give him your days. And you'll look back over your life and say, oh, how in the world did that happen? When did that How did that happen? And that's God saying, if you'll give me your days, I'll make good use of them. God is not a waster. God is not slack concerning his promises. God is good to those things. When you give God your life and you give God your time, God multiplies it and God makes much of it. But let me say this about the enemy. The enemy is a waster. And he wastes our time and he wastes our life. And he tells us there's no reason to get up and get going. There's no reason to move forward. There's no reason to be in it. Don't listen to that preacher. Don't be in any hurry. Don't be eager to do anything now. Wait till the spring. Wait till next year. But the Lord says, hey, today, today, let's go forward today. Those five kings get whipped. Those men get whipped. And they're dealt with. Remember, we touched on all that. We can't every week. But the Amorites were a people who had hated God and rejected God and refused God. And God had given them plenty of time to get things squared away. If their time was come for judgment from God. They were a bunch of people who did nasty things. They abused each other. They abused their children. They were a mess. And God was using Israel to bring judgment upon them. Five of those kings, of course, they left their men out in the field and they went and hid themselves in a cave. Joshua heard about it. He said, put a stone in front of it and keep fighting. We'll come back and deal with them later. We'll talk about those five kings tonight. But God gave great victory that day. God caused that day to be prolonged almost another day so that they could get rid of the enemy that day and have victory as God had promised them. And God said in verse 14, there was no day like that before. I want to spend the rest of my life experiencing great days. I want to be as they were in Gilgal, the place of remembrance, the place of uh, just memorial and considering who the Lord is and what he's done for me. I want to live in that state. I want to be prayed up and read up and meditated up, if you will, prepared to face each and every day. I want to be considerate of those around me and look for needs that can be met. I want to be earnest in my response I want to recognize divine promise and know that I have divine presence. I need divine intervention. And I'm asking the Lord to take what days I have and use them in a great way and make much of them. And I believe that he can. He did for Joshua and he did for Israel. And I believe he'll do the same for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Please, Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we've been able to spend in your word. And Lord, for this good testimony of Joshua and Israel and what you accomplished there. Lord, I have no Gibeonites to defend. I have no... Uh, oh, Hivites and Parasites and Jebusites to fight, but I do have the good fight. I do have the cause of Christ to be involved in and to be engaged in. And Lord, I desire today, just as you promised and you helped, I desire in my life and the lives of these fine folks, Lord, today, that they too would recognize that. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would say, preacher, there was something in that for me today as a child of God regarding good days and great days and letting the Lord use what days I have for his glory You'd say, Preacher, there was something in that for me today. Would you raise your hand that I might pray for you? You'd say, Preacher, there was something in it for me. Very good. I trust that you'll let the Lord work in your heart and in your life. I trust that you'll experience good days, victorious days this new year, that we'll let the Lord bless this year and multiply it and bring much fruit from it. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who's here today? You'd say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I don't know that my sins are forgiven. I have a Conflict in my heart at being at peace with others because I'm really not even at peace with God. I'm, I, I, I'm concerned. I, I don't know. I don't know for sure if I were to die that heaven would be my home. I don't know that my sins have been forgiven like the Bible says they can be. And you'd say, preacher, please pray for me today. I'd like to know more about being saved. Preacher, please pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Who's here this morning? Say, preacher, please pray for me. I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know that. I don't have that testimony. Who would say that? Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. If you're here this morning and you're saved, but you've never followed the Lord and believers' baptism, we have someone coming today for that. We encourage you to do the same. Step out and identify with the Lord in baptism. Let's go forward for the Lord. Here in just a moment, we'll ask the pianist to play. Maybe the Lord's touched your heart in a way of testimony or service or surrender. As the Lord deals with your heart, you want to step out and seal that decision at the altar. If you want to come and pray for someone or pray about a situation, whatever it may be, I trust that you'll move as the Lord stirs your heart. Let's stand on our feet, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Trust in the Lord now to do a work in our lives, in our hearts.